Hello friends. Today the theme of our discussion is the President of India. In our broad theme on the President of India, we will be highlighting on the essential qualifications required for the post of the President of India. Secondly, the election of the President of India. Thirdly, an evaluation of the method of the President of India, method of election of the President of India. Fourthly, the tenure and removal of the President of India. And finally, an evaluation of the method of impeachment. As we all know that India has adopted a federal system of government. At the head of the Union Executive stands the President of India. Article 52 of the Indian Constitution states that there shall be a President of India. Article 53 of the Constitution declares that all the executive actions of the Union or executive powers of the Union are to be vested in the President. All the executive actions of the Union are vested in the President expressly. But there is no such corresponding provision in the Constitution of India vesting the legislative or the judicial powers in a particular organ of the state. In fact, the state confers the judicial power on the courts and the tribunals. This vertical division of power into three distinct organs of the state, namely the legislature, the executive and the judiciary, is more popularly known as the theory of separation of power. This theory of separation of power is more pronounced in the modern constitution like that of the United States of America, while it is not so in the other countries. In Constitution of India, so far as our constitution is concerned, the principle of the separation of powers is not rigidly followed. While the legislative power is vested in the legislature, yet we find Article 123 and 213 of our constitution, which conveys the power to issue ordinances on the president and the governor respectively. However, the exercise of these powers are to be, uh, are to be done in conformity with the relevant situations. What is more interesting about the Indian Constitution is that our Constitution has created the post of the President of India, but it has not adopted a presidential form of government. In fact, India has adopted a parliamentary form of government in which the President happens to be the constitutional head of the state, while the real powers are vested in none other than the Council of Ministers. The Prime Minister, being the head of the Council of Ministers, is a real executive of the Union. Article 74 of the Indian Constitution states that there shall be a Council of Ministers to aid and advise the President in the exercise of his functions. This article also further prescribes that the President must act in accordance with the advice provided to him by the Council of Ministers. Article 75, Section 3 of the Indian Constitution states that the Council of Ministers are responsible to the Lok Sabha. However, there is no such corresponding provision in the Constitution of India stating that the President is also answerable or responsible to the Lok Sabha. So this article implies that it, this article therefore lay the very foundation of the parliamentary form of government in our country. So it is a council of ministers who has the final authority to decide on matters relating the administration of the union. The president, being a mere formal or titular head, has to carry out his, uh, has, to ca has to act in accordance with the advice provided to him by the council of ministers. Now let us see the essential qualifications which are required for a person to, to become the President of India. First of all, the person must be a citizen of India. Secondly, must have completed the age of 35 years. Thirdly, must have the required qualification of election as a member of the Lok Sabha. 
Fourthly, must not hold any office of profit under the government of India, state government, or even a local authority. And finally, Article 59 of the Constitution provides that after being elected as a President of India, the person cannot be a member of both the Houses of the Parliament and even the state legislature. So this implies that once being elected as a president, the seat in the legislature is likely to be vacated from the day on which the person assumes the office of the president of India. The procedure for election of the President in India is mentioned in Article 54 and 55 of the Constitution. The President is generally elected by an indirect election through an electoral college in accordance with the system of proportional representation by means of a single transferable vote. Article 54 of the Constitution declares that the Electoral College shall compose of the following members. They are, first of all, the elected members of both the Houses of the Parliament and secondly, the elected members of the State Legislature. Article 55 of the Constitution provides the formula of uniformity in the scale of representation of different states as far as practicable by incorporating the method of proportional representation by means of a single transferable vote. This article ensures that the seats of the state uh, in aggregate with the electoral college which is meant for the election of the president shall be equal with that of the entire population of the country. So the president of India is not only a representative of the entire nation, he or she is also a representative of the people of different states of India. Now let us see how the method of election actually works. Professor J.C. Johari, while describing the method of election of the president, has cited several stages. Let us examine these stages. At the very first stage, total number of votes of the elected members of the state legislature are to be determined. Here it must be noted that all the elected members of the state legislature has a single vote to cast so far as the election of the president is concerned. But the value of the vote, value of their vote is not equal. In fact, the value of the vote is determined by a formula. Let us see the formula. Total number of votes of an elected MLA equals population of the state as being mentioned in the last census report, which is divided by total number of elected MLAs which once again is further divided by 1000. So let us take an hypothetical example so that things become a bit clear to us. If we assume that the population of the state is 50 lakh and the total number of elected members in the state legislature is 50, then the total number of votes of an elected MLA will be 50 lakh divided by 50 which comes down to 1 lakh, which is further divided by 1000, giving the result of 100. So, the value of each vote of an elected MLA is equal to that of 100. But what will happen if there is a remainder? In case there exists a remainder which is more than 500, then the votes of each candidate is to be increased by 1. At the second stage, the total number of votes of an elected member of the of the elected members of the parliament are to be determined here too uh, it is obtained by using another formula the formula goes like this total number of votes of an elected mp equals total number of votes assigned to all elected mlas divided by total number of the elected member of the parliament at the third stage, the election of the president actually takes place by means of a secret ballot. 
In this particular stage, a ballot paper is being given to the voters in which we find that at the left hand side of the ballot paper, left hand columns of the ballot paper, the name of the candidate along with the party symbols are mentioned, while the right hand columns are left vacant. The voter is required to give his list of preferences in the right hand column. Accordingly, the voter may use the numericals 1, 2, 3 and so on so as to show his list of, a, so as to show his list of uh, preferences in the presidential election. At the fourth stage, once the election got over, counting takes place. Now, before counting is taken place, all the invalid votes are rejected and an electoral quota is determined by using another formula. Electoral quota equals total number of valid votes polled divided by 2 plus 1. Then counting will begin. Now in case a candidate secures the number of votes as being mentioned in the electoral quota at the very first round, then the candidate will, de will be declared to be elected. But if it is not so, then subsequent rounds has to be calculated until and unless the result is declared. In the subsequent round, the candidate having a least, amount, least number of votes will be eliminated and his or her votes will be transferred to the other candidates in accordance with the second preference. In this way, the votes of the other candidates will be enhanced. This procedure of, um, this procedure of elimination will continue until the results are being depicted. Now, uh, a critical examination of the uh, method of the election of the president reveals that there are certain inherent limitations. Uh, there are certain inherent limitations. Let us examine these limitations. First of all, the expression proportional representation is incorrect in the sense that proportional representation can take place only when there exist at least two seats. So, in other words, it implies that the system of proportional representation cannot take place, is not applicable when there is a single member constituency. It was rightly pointed out by Professor M. P. Sharma in the year 1950 when he stated that the term proportional representation should be replaced and he, and he gave certain alternatives to it. He argued in favor of preferential or alternative vote system as a replacement of the proportional representation. Secondly, the constitution is not does not make it clear as what shall happen if there is a lame duck situation. The 11th Amendment Act of 1961 provide that the president of that the election of the president should not be invalid even if there exist certain vacancies in the electoral college. However, it does not make clear that what shall happen if a president's rule exists in a particular operates in a particular state as it had been done in the state of Gujarat in the year 1974. Again, it was not clear as what shall happen if half state emergency is declared in a state as it was in the case of Punjab, as it was in the case of the state of Punjab in the year 1966. Thirdly, it was argued that the election procedure of the president hardly provides any opportunity to a non-political personality to get elected for the post. It implies that the, there is a greater possibility of a candidate to win only when if he or she is backed by a political party having a majority in the electoral college. Fourthly, the procedure of presidential election is highly complicated and it is beyond the understanding of an ordinary citizen of the country. In fact, things becomes even more complicated if there exists a coalition government at the center and each of the political parties in the coalition desires to give, his, give its own candidate for the post of presidential election. 
Finally, Dr. K. V. Rao argued that the system of election of the President of India seems to be unscientific in nature. It was more or less like a knockout tournament in which the first preference is given a greater priority compared to the second or the third one. Now, on the question of the presidential election, there were many constitutional experts who were of the opinion that the President of India should have been directly elected. In fact, such, a, such an argument had even haunted the members of the, uh, the members of the Constituent Assembly way back. Though they were minorities in number and the majorities were in favour of an indirect election, several reasons were cited in this regard. First of all, they argued that India has adopted a parliamentary system of government and in such a system of government already uh, an elected prime minister is existing in the existing system of government. So if the president is again elected, then there might be a situation in which the president coming in conflict with the prime minister, thereby creating a constitutional crisis. So the constitutional experts believe that to avoid such a crisis, an indirect, indirectly elected president would be a much better preference. Secondly, it was argued that the role of the president is in India is merely a constitutional one. So it would be a colossal waste of time, energy and money if the president is directly elected since the post happened to be more ornamental in nature. Finally, it was argued that in case of a direct election of the president, for two or more candidates, there is a possibility of electing the one who would be having the majority in the parliament. Now let us see the tenure and removal of the president of India. The president holds his office for a period of five years. Uh, his period of five years begins only when he takes an oath before the Chief Justice of India. Now, before uh, the, the, the post of the President of India can be vacated, may be vacated for, on, uh, due to several reasons. Let us examine these reasons. First of all, the post may be vacated on account of the expiry of the normal tenure of the president. Secondly, it may be vacated on account of the death of the president. Or thirdly, it may be vacated if the president gives his resignation. Now, apart from all this normal uh, a normal way if through which the president is through which the post of the president may be vacated there are occasions when the post is temporarily vacated and in this respect the vice president will take over the charge of the president of india and finally the the post of the president may be vacated by the process of impeachment now what is the process of impeachment Article 56, Section 1 of the Constitution provides that the President of India may be removed by the method of impeachment on the ground of violation of the Constitution. Now, this procedure might be initiated by either House of the Parliament and presented before the other House. The responsibility of the other House will be to investigate the charge by itself or cause for the investigation of the charge. Now, um, the charge cannot be preferred by a house until and unless the two conditions are fulfilled. These two conditions are, first of all, a resolution containing the proposal is moved after a 14 days notice in writing signed by not less than one fourth members of that house. And secondly, the resolution is then passed by not less than two-thirds of the total membership of the House. The President, however, shall have the right to appear and to be represented at such investigation. After such investigation, if, a, if, the, house, if the resolution is passed by two-thirds majority of the House, then the President will have to give his resignation, then the President may be removed from the office. 
Now, since the constitution has provided the terms and conditions for the removal of the president of India, he cannot be removed otherwise, uh, he cannot be removed other than the procedure of impeachment. And this is in accordance with Article 56 and 61 of the constitution. A critical study of the procedure of uh, the impeachment uh, method suggests that there are certain limitations to this particular process. First of all, the phrase violation of uh, the constitution is delightfully vague. It is not clear as what it includes and what it shall exclude. In fact, Professor B. M. Sharma feels that any act on the part of the President may be regarded as a violation of the Constitution if it goes against the wishes of the Council of Ministers. Secondly, it was argued that the members of the state legislature are not taken into account so far as the method of impeachment is concerned, despite the fact that they have taken active part in the election of the President of India. Thirdly, it is being argued that the provision of uh, at least one-fourth members at the initiation of the resolution and two-third majority members at the adoption of the resolution is required, but it is not clear whether the members would be nominated or elected. In fact, the nominated members are also being included, then naturally the question might erupt that why the nominated members are included in the method of impeachment when they have nothing to do with the election of the President of India. Fourthly, it was argued that the provision that the House of the Parliament shall investigate the church uh, is understandable, but it is not clear whether the House will do the tedious job itself or will appoint some judicial commission for the said purpose. Fifthly, it is not clear what time the investigating House will be giving to the President for making his defence, since the term short duration does not give an idea of any, any specific time period. During this period, the president may likely to influence the outcome by his personal equation. Sixthly, it may be suggested that the president has the ex power to summon prorogue and dissolve the Lok Sabha. And these powers the president may exercise in delaying the process of impeachment. Finally, above all the requirement of the two-third majority, uh, makes the whole affair a tedious one and that goes to the benefit of the president himself. So in conclusion, we can say that uh, keeping in view of all the inherent limitations and inconsistencies existing in the provisions of impeachment, we can say that the process of impeachment is not only a cumbersome one, but at the same time, it is also a very long delayed process. As such of these limitations, the process will tend to make it more ineffective and even and almost impossible to apply it in practice. Thank you.